Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. I am delighted to welcome you here tonight. And I'm delighted to share with you um, LBJ, a film by Rob Reiner, which is absolutely sensational. I had the pleasure of seeing it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm confident that you'll enjoy it everybody, every bit as much as I did. Um, this is a review from Variety that, that um, praises the film. And one of the excerpts from the review reads, when you watch a biopic, the hero stands in on some level for all of us. And maybe the movies are having an LBJ moment currently because Johnson, in his tug of war between complacency and idealism, racism and brotherly love, reflects something about a great many of us. That spirit inside that makes us want to be better, but only because we know deep down that we're not all we should be. His evolution is a reflection of all of us. What you're going to see in this film, I think, is uh, I think a very fair portrayal of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, you'll watch the film, and then afterwards, I hope you'll stick around for a discussion that I'll moderate with uh, Rob Reiner, the director, Joey Hartstone, the writer, and Woody Harrelson, the star. And I have the pleasure of introducing them now, and I'll bring them out uh, one at a time. But I'll start with the producer, who won't be participating in the conversation, but we are delighted that he's here, Matthew George. Matthew, can you come out? Please welcome Joey Hartstone, the writer of the film. The legendary Rob Reiner, the director. And the equally legendary Woody Harrelson, who stars in the title role as LBJ. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, again, thank all of you. Enjoy the film, and we'll see you afterward. Uh, the, uh, Matt George, uh, the reason he's not uh, speaking is because he's from Australia. And, and, and you say, well, what would he know about LGBT? But the fact is, he knows more about American history than any of us. So there you go. <laughs> backstage and, and Woody said, where's Lucy? Why is she not here? <laughs> we didn't know what, we want to know what she thinks and uh, Lucy was standing, so I think that's a good sign. <laughs> Where is Lucy? Lucy oh, stood good. up, yes, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Uh, well, let's, uh, congratulations, gentlemen, on a, on a wonderful movie. Joey, let's start with you. Um, how did you write this? Why did you write this movie? Um, a few guys in L.A. had an idea to do a movie about Lyndon Johnson, and they just wanted it to be about uh, this moment in time. And I didn't know very much about him. I knew a lot about the Kennedys. And the more I learned about Johnson, the more I realized that it was his humanity that really appealed to me. And the Kennedys were this awesome, untouchable force, but Johnson had something that people could relate to, or at least I could relate to. And it made me want to tell the story of that character. How did you delve into the story? How did you learn about this very uh, complex man. Started with the Robert Caro books and then read everything else I could and I just kept reading until I started to understand what was going to come next in every book. And then there are so many different variations of Lyndon Johnson in these books that ultimately you sort of have to pick and choose and decide who the man is or who your character is going to be. And once I felt confident who that was, yeah. I started writing. 
Rob, uh, you are a child of the 60s, and so many of us grew up watching All in the Family, and you played Mike Stivick, and you would have been one of those guys outside the White House yes. with a picket sign. I was one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't outside the White House, but I was of draft age during the Vietnam War, and uh, I was against the war, and uh, we, the country was divided. And I had a certain, um, you know, I was looking at Lyndon Johnson through you know, my prism, which was, you know, I, I could be sent away to war and I could die and all of that. And it took me a, a long time to mature uh, and spend time uh, working in government and in politics and understanding public policy and how things are shaped and how things are moved to really appreciate uh, what Lyndon Johnson was able to do. And once I understood that, uh, it changed my perception completely of, of who he was. So that when uh, the script came to me, um, initially I thought, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can, t and Woody, we, we had, Woody and I had the same discussions about it, mm -hmm. which is what, you know, how can we find the humanity in this guy? Because every, you know, thing you read and all the books and all the moving things that have been done, they're always this kind of two-dimensional uh, character who is uh, strong and he can twist arms and he gets what he wants and he's a great negotiator. But, um, you know, I also read all the Carol books and when I read this one biography by Doris Kearns Goodwin, that's when I really got to understand more of who Lyndon Johnson was, because he was, like everybody, was a very complex person and had certain insecurities. And I remember reading two things in that book um, that a lot more of his humanity came out in his, uh, I kind of get, maybe it's because, um, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin worked with him and then she went down to the ranch and she worked on this biography. But the one was the about this recurring dream that he had about being paralyzed. Uh, he had seen his, uh, I guess it was his grandmother or his aunt, you know, in a wheelchair, and he would have this dream about not being able to move, you know, not being able to uh, go forward. And then the other thing was about his relationship with his mother, you know, which was also complex and not simple. His mother loved him, but also wanted him to uh, you know, succeed in a certain way, and I think he felt insecure at times and feeling like he wasn't up to it or he wasn't pleasing her in some way. So those are the two things that I took. We know the historical stuff. We know what he was able to accomplish, but the trick was to make him human and make him uh, a full three round, uh, you know, a full dimensional character, and that's why I was really lucky uh, when Woody agreed to do it because Woody brings a lot of humanity, he brings warmth, he brings humor, he brings all, all of this, uh, you know, uh, the sweetness and the strength, all of those things. And if we were going to make a movie about Lyndon Johnson, to me, what we want to make a movie that's about the total cat guy. Mm -hmm. And even though it was a small sliver of time that we looked at, if that doesn't emerge, then, then you know, we're just doing a, a documentary or we're just doing another, you know, uh, dry thing. But, but, you know, luckily Woody agreed to do it. And, uh, you know, it's the, one of the most brilliant performances I've ever seen. I mean, it's just incredible. Woody is a friend of the LBJ Libraries. He came down here to study the role last year. We, we had the great good fortune of getting to know him. Woody, um, and as I, you were, so Woody was on his way to New Orleans where the film was shot, and you were nervous about inhabiting, the, uh, inhabiting rather this, this character, this very complex character, but you got it, and, and you got the subtleties of LBJ. How do, talk about the process by which you got to know this character inhabit him and convey him as you did? Well, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm so excited to be here. I, I've now, this is my fifth time to see this movie. 
Am I cutting out a little bit? I'm kind of cutting out. Maybe I should do my theatrical diaphragm thing and just project without a mic. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, I, I just, it's, every time I've seen it, it's, it's been an extraordinary thing. Saw it at, uh, you know, in Toronto, in, in Zurich, and in New Orleans. And uh, also, the first time I saw it was with Rob in his office. And that was terrifying. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was terrifying for me, too, because I asked Woody, I said, are you one of these actors that doesn't like yourself on film? Because I was worried we're going to, just the two of us sitting in a room, I thought, oh, my God, what if he just can't look at this? And, and he was, you were nervous, too. You yeah. were really nervous. But then he liked it, and I said, yeah. ah, good. Uh, I didn't mess him up. But uh, so I'm just saying that, like, this to me was the most exciting thing to, to watch this yeah. year, and especially uh, with Mark and everything that he did to, you know, make this a reality for me and help me understand the, the man and the myth a little better. And uh, um, just... The fact that Lucy is here is, uh, I cannot tell you how exciting that is. I mean, I'm dying to hear what she thought, but I guess we'll wait until after I'm <laughs> done uh, droning on. Just uh, give us either this or this. <laughs> yeah. Just one of this. Even if it's this. Oh, my God. But, but I'm, did, did everybody did everybody hear what she said? She all right. She said she said I knew the man that you played tonight. I recognized him, and I loved him. But but then she whispered, "Did you have to do the thing about the slacks?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, all I could think of, I mean, I've had two experiences um, showing a movie where I was nervous, really nervous. Um, this uh, one time was, uh, we were doing When Harry Met Sally, a royal premiere, and Princess Di was sitting, uh, a two, uh, two uh, there, Billy Crystal was here, and then was Princess Di, and I'm thinking, oh, here comes the orgasm scene. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what is she gonna do? And, and she laughed and she turned to Billy, she said, I'd be laughing a lot more, but people are looking at me. <laughs> and tonight, I had the same feeling. I was thinking, all I was thinking about is Lucy and the certain things that you, you know, as her father did. And I thought, oh, gee, I hope it's okay. That's all I could think of. I was thinking that on the toilet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was going to say. Right. <laughs> Joe, we'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> There'll be plenty of time at dinner to talk about that. Joey, let's go back to your yeah, great dinner conversation. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's go back to your script, your Marvel script. One of the things you get right, I think, is, is the very complicated relationship between LBJ and the Kennedys, which I think so many people, I think, have the perception uh, as being monolithic. Uh, talk about that and how you understood better the relationship between uh, LBJ and JFK and RFK. If I could just jump back real quick to Please. your first question. Um, I, there's a lot of process that goes into the script. Um, my guess is, I don't know who the person is on this stage that you most want to hear from, but I know who the last one is, which is why I breeze through my answers as quickly as possible so you can hear from these two guys. But actually, the two guys in LA who I didn't name by name, not because I forgot them, but because I wanted to get to them too, because I like hearing from them, are Tim and Trevor White. And so these were the two producers who brought me this story. And the script was actually developed by all three of us. So I would, I would write each draft, give it to these two guys, and they would come back with lots of incredible notes. And that's how it went from being 120 pages that were all about Lyndon to being a story about Lyndon. So um, obviously, the Kennedy men and Johnson are a really big uh, focal point of this. I think the biggest surprise I had in researching it was I, I sort of thought that they hated each other. That was kind of the 
the misunderstanding, especially with, with John Kennedy, there was a lot of respect and admiration between the two presidents, and that made it uh, more complex to write. And then for me, Bobby Kennedy has always been a hero of mine, and Rob and his wife like to give me some crap for that, but Bobby is someone I really admire, and I saw Bobby as a worthy opponent. Uh, he's very, he's very driven, very, very, he's not the guy you'd want to go up against, and, and, but because he's the opponent, he makes our hero rise even higher. Rob, how do you see the Kennedys? John Kennedy's in so many ways, partly because he was a martyr, a liberal emblem. Uh, and I suspect that when you were in the 1960s, you may have seen him in the same manner while seeing, sort of vilifying Lyndon Johnson. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Well, it, it is fair at that time, but like I say, having spent as much time as I have in government and politics and developing public policy, and I've spent a lot of time as an adult doing that, I have so much greater respect for what Lyndon Johnson was able to achieve. And there's a line in it where it says, you know, Kennedy was a man of ideas, now we need a man, you know, of action, a man who can get things done. And at working through, you know, with early childhood that we, you know, my wife Michelle was over there, we worked on that, we worked on marriage equality, we worked on environmental issues, so, so many things. To understand how difficult it is to move the ball forward and to see what Lyndon Johnson was able to do, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. But you have to understand it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I have no illusions about politics at all. I care about one thing and one thing only, moving things forward, getting things done. That's all that matters. So, you know, those personality things and that and the other. To me, Lyndon Johnson is the epitome of what you want in a public servant. It's not about looks or all that. It's about get, getting stuff done. And, you know, Hillary Clinton's been vilified for all kinds of things. She can get things done. And that's all I care about. That's all I care about. And, and she knows how to work. She knows how to work across the aisle, just the way Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson knew how to work across the aisle. He knew that it's not it's not enough to just you know uh, you know cry into the wind about what you want to have happen. It's about understanding people's personalities, getting people together, and working. You know, just really sticking to it. And you got to admire that. I mean, that to me, you know, look at the list. I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, it's, I mean, it just goes on and on. And these are programs that are still around and still, you know, uh, you know helping society. This is, this is big legacy stuff, yeah. you know? And when you think about it, you think about, you know, FDR, and he did, you know, was, came out of a, uh, you know, but Lyndon Johnson, look what he did. Look what he did. You can't look at any president and say, this much was accomplished in that short a time. And it had not been for Vietnam. I don't think he wanted it. I mean, it was like he was stuck, you know, yeah. stuck. And I didn't understand that then. I understand it now. I do get it now. It's taken me a long time. I, you know, to, to be fair, I think it's taken history a long a time long to catch time up to the legacy to of Lyndon Johnson that. because of the complications of yeah. Vietnam. Woody, uh, you have become one of our most accomplished actors. Why did you want to play this role? Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I deserved it, but I'll take that. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, you know what? I, I wanted to work with Rob Reiner. I think Rob Reiner is just one of the great directors we have. He's like a master of his craft. And uh, I've admired him for so long, and so many things he's, he's done have moved me and made me laugh. And, uh, so uh, in spite of, uh, as I was telling Lucy, I had some an initial, you know, nervousness about Johnson because of the Vietnam legacy. But, uh, you know, I read this incredible script written by Joey Hartstone that is, like, an amazing script and then met with Rob, and then the next thing you know, uh, Bob's your uncle. And, uh, 
And I'm so psyched to now be working in New Orleans with Rob on another script that Joey Hartstone wrote called Shock and All, which is a phenomenal uh, script as well. So, I don't know. Uh, I just, I'm, am I answering your question? Yes, yes, you are. I, I realize uh, I'm just going on. No, it's fabulous. Uh, and we're going to talk about Shock and All in a moment, the, the next project that you have in the works. Trying to get PR for our project. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, let me ask, so you grew, you grew up here in Texas. Did you have a preconception of Lyndon Johnson? Well, yeah, like I say, it wasn't entirely a favorable idea of Lyndon Johnson. So, you know, it was great to dive into this. You know, once the decision was made, the only thing to do was to really try to get to know him as good as possible, which is what brought us together the first time. And uh, so the more I learned about him, it's just like what Rob said. You realize, oh, my God, look what he accomplished. And, yeah, he was trapped in Vietnam. I, he, the so-called wise men just continued to give him bad advice. And uh, he and Robert R McNamara really uh, had some friction over that. But uh, I, I, I really admire the man. It, it's when, when you look at somebody as complex as this, uh, Rob, you called him Shakespearean. Where do you, was there something that gave you a clue to his humanity? Was there one thing that what we thought, yeah, I get it. Um, uh, and now I can sort of uh, begin figuring out how to play this role. Well, I think there was a lot of factors, but mo maybe more than anything was just listening to him talk on the phone. I mean, he was electrifying. I mean, he was amazing. The, the way he would talk to people. He's just a genuinely great communicator. And uh, I started to just feel his humanity more. You know, there'd be times he's really distressed or times he's, you know, adamant about trying to make this happen or that. You know, he's, he's a great guy in a lot of ways. And, you know, he had a, a tough time with the Vietnam legacy. But uh, as I said to Lucy, I think he'd be considered maybe our greatest president were it not for Vietnam. Uh, yeah. Rob, Rob let me, you have a fascinating career. Uh, I mentioned all the family, which is when you, uh, you we, we came to know you. Your father was in the business. Um, how do you choose projects? Uh, I, I try to, I mean, for the most part, I just try to find something that I can connect to. There has to be something in it where I can connect to the main character in some way. And uh, if I can, then I can tell that story, the story of those, those people. Some of them are more personal than others. And this is a kind of movie that I wouldn't have been able to do uh, 10, 20, you know, 20 years ago. I couldn't have done it. Why? Because I wouldn't have been able to connect to Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. It took me growing up, it took all of the experience I had, like I say, working in in, 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 in politics and government to really, un, to really appreciate it and to connect with them. So it has to be I, relatable to you. So I have to rela be able to relate yeah. to it. I also felt, you know, in reading th that, that he had a lot of insecurities and people who are as accomplished, you look at people who have accomplished a lot, they usually have tremendous insecurities and they fight to overcome those insecurities to be able to achieve things. And that I understand too. I can get I get that about about how how he was able to to you know, and and I think that's that's what we try to show in the movie that it, you know that he he was fighting in many cases his own demons, but when you do that and you are able to push past it, you can accomplish a lot. You can either be uh, subsumed by your demons or you can. Uh, overcome them, and I think that he was fighting that his whole life, and I think he was, uh, it, it was in a way an impetus for him to, to, to go forward, you know? And, and I felt that my whole life. There's always a time like, a, oh my God, I doubt myself, oh, 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 and then you go, no, I'm gonna, and then you, then you go forward, and hopefully your skills kick in, and you can do, you know? I mean, that's what you do, I mean. So, so what do you also, we came to know you through a, an iconic television series, Cheers, in the 1980s, uh, and you've had this fascinating career. How do you choose roles? You've played this, like Rob, Rob has an incredibly eclectic body of work. So do you. 
How do you choose a role? Well, I mean, a lot of what he said is true. You know, you have to connect to it, but sometimes, uh, you know, I just think this is really funny. It doesn't have to be a piece with... I like the for, for it to have heart, you know. The heart of it, if you can kind of connect to the beating heart of it, then, you know, there's something. But I, I've definitely done times where I didn't connect to the heart and I somehow convinced myself to do it and those are always disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> right, honey? <laughs> that is Laura Woody's bride who is with him tonight. Uh, Joey, talk about Shock and Awe. Uh, shock and Awe. Um, the movie that you're currently doing with Rob and Woody. Tell us a little bit about that. So that was Rob's idea. Um, we hadn't started LBJ yet, and Rob called and said, hey, I want to do a movie about journalism and the Iraq war. Would you like to do that? And I thought, yes, I would. Or any <laughs> other movie you'd like to do, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he found these four journalists in DC who worked at a company called Knight Ritter that um, is a consortium, or was, of about 31 newspapers across the country. And these were four guys who, from 9-11 up until the day we invade Iraq, really get all their reporting right. They, they uh, are skeptical about the WMD, about Iraq connection to 9-11, uh, all of it, but they're largely ignored. And so it's sort of an all the president's men type story where these guys have, are, are tapping into the truth but nobody's listening to them and they're trying to get it out there uh, before it's too late. And when can we expect this project, Rob? Well, we're shooting it right now. Yeah. And so we'll be done uh, in about three weeks or so. And then, you know, we'll... So like a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He does. Yeah. He's very fast. Well, very. We've, we're about halfway through now. And then it'll come out next year. I mean, it'll be interesting because it may come out around the time. Unless we can, unless LBJ comes out at the end of the year, we don't know yet. We, we, we have few offers from a number of companies that want to distribute LBJ. And the question is whether or not we try to run fast and try to get it out at the end of this year. If not, both of those pictures will come out next year. And so you guys, have, no sooner wrap up this project than you just jump right back into the next one. What is that like, literally? Like, uh, one day you're, uh, you're directing one project with this same writer, with the same star, and the next day you're doing a totally different project. How does that work? Well, it, you don't, it's not always one after the other. I mean, you know, I mean, for actors it's different, but for a director, you don't usually do one right after the yeah. other. I've done three movies now in the last two years. I mean, I mean, the last year and a half or whatever. And it doesn't usually work that way. I mean, for shock and awe, it's something that I've been thinking about for 10 years and trying to figure out how to do it and trying different ways of going. And when I had this great, you know, experience with Joey and his writing was so good on LBJ, I thought, wow, you know, what if he, then you just luck out if a guy says, oh yes, and then all of a sudden something comes you know, it comes together, and then you just luckily find, you know, Matt George, who jumps in and finances it, you just run and do it. I mean, right. but you can go two, three years without getting something done if, if uh, you know, if nobody wants to give you the money, you know. <laughs> but he gave us the money, so we got Joey, it sounds like you're gold. Yeah, it's been a good couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, uh, congratulations again on a marvelous mission. We can't thank you enough for coming thank down to you. the library. Thank you so much.